Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members of parliament, it is a privilege and a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on how to make the Human Rights Council cooperate even better with national parliaments. I would like to thank the Interparliamentary Union, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Secretariat of the Commonwealth for the brilliant idea of organizing this webinar. And I very much thank the Secretary General of the IPU, Mr. Martin Chungong, for inviting me to address you today. It is my great honor to be the President of the Human Rights Council this year. This has given me the opportunity to see a bit more of the Council's inner nuts and bolts and realize what an incredible machinery it is. This machinery literally involves thousands of people, different groups of stakeholders, as we say in the UN jargon, all of whom participate in making the Council's mandate come true, that is to say, promote and protect human rights. Among these various groups, we have the diplomats, like myself, who are there to speak on behalf of their own countries. They often get criticized by civil society for not being sufficiently outspoken or by other states, by other states for being too outspoken. Their job is to keep all channels of conversation open and to build bridges in spite of existing problems and different interests and to act as two-way interpreters, explaining in their capitals what happens at the UN and vice versa. Another group of stakeholders are civil society organizations, many of whom work on the ground, admittedly much closer than diplomats to where human rights violations can occur. Civil society organizations help the Council collect information about what is going on all over the world. There is an enormous variety among NGOs with regard to the subjects or regions they cover, but also with regard to the quality and reliability of their work. Some of them have won Nobel Prizes, as you know, others clearly never will. Yet another group of stakeholders are the so-called special mandate holders. All in all, about 70 persons who work for the councils as special rapporteurs, independent experts, or commissions of inquiry, these are different shades of mandates, to research on the situation in a particular country or with regard to a specific topic of human rights. These mandate holders are specialists, professors, judges, practitioners, who are often called the eyes and ears of the council. As you can imagine, they are not always very popular in the countries where they conduct their research. After all, their job is to diagnose deficiencies and make recommendations on how to redress them. And then there is the Universal Periodic Review, the special focus of this webinar. The UPR was one of the most innovative ideas when the Human Rights Council was established in 2006. The inspiration for it came from the International Labour Organization's Committee of Experts on the Application of Conventions and Recommendations, which one of its former Directors General very appropriately described as unwritten wisdom based on a firm adherence to accepted international standards, a scrupulous thoroughness, the strictest objectivity, recognition of the need for a sympathetic understanding of what lies beyond the letter of the law, of problems of timing and practical difficulties, and acceptance of the duty to observe the highest standards of tact and courtesy in the valuation of complex and delicate problems. This is quite a tall order. The UPR is not only a useful tool for nudging states to embark on sensitive issues. As opposed to some of the mandate holders, it is also quite popular with states, presumably because all countries are treated equally. No one is more equal than others. Self-confident, prosperous countries are often surprised about how many recommendations they get. While countries which show a lot of goodwill, but lack resources, and this is, after all, the majority of countries on this planet are treated with what the Director General called tact and courtesy. The UPR is a four and a half year cycle. That means that every country is reviewed every four and a half years. And up to now, it's scored 100% participation by all the member states of the United Nations. So it is genuinely universal. All the various groups of stakeholders whom I mentioned, the High Commissioner, her office, the mandate holders and civil society participate in the effort and prepare reports, analyzing the country under review from various angles. Experience shows that this review is taken very seriously. Usually at least one minister personally travels to Geneva 
to present the national report and answer questions and recommendations. If the media shows some interest, governments are even more motivated. This is where national parliaments come in. As you probably know, the Human Rights Council does not have any legally binding instruments. And there is no such thing as a universal human rights court, however much some academics discuss the idea. Yet human rights are only worth their name if they get implemented. And the most reliable way of doing so is to make them a legal reality at the domestic level. Incidentally, the Council dealt with the importance of national parliaments again and again. Four years ago, for example, it appealed to national parliaments to help translate international human rights commitments into national policies and laws. It also recommended to parliamentarians to travel to Geneva as part of their government delegations and listen to the three-hour debate on their country. As you're going to hear later on, the UPR process lasts several months for any country under review, from dressing up the national report to presenting it to the Council, receiving recommendations and finally implementing them. The Council, in its resolution 35-29, encouraged members of Parliament to join in whenever they choose to do so. Two years ago, the Office of the High Commissioner, in cooperation with the IPU, presented a report on how to strengthen synergies between parliaments and the Human Rights Council. This report focused very much on the importance of parliamentary human rights committees and included a draft principles on parliaments and human rights, for example, on how to set up such committees, their working methods, etc. I realize that parliamentarians have a very full agenda, and all of this may sound rather time-consuming to you. But please do give a thought to the fact that the UPR is a very solid stock-taking exercise which can help to get some things done at a speed suitable for the country in question. Of course, the current year is somewhat special. The UPR round originally scheduled for May had to be postponed to November and we shall see whether traveling will be back to normal by then. I am happy to say that the Human Rights Council as a whole managed to adjust rather well to the special situation. We had a lockdown as from March and needed to find new ways of working because the COVID crisis is not only a health emergency and an economic crisis as a consequence, but importantly, also a major human rights crisis. It somehow worked like a magnifying glass for existing human rights issues, in particular for what we call the vulnerable groups of the population. So for the first time, we had to organize virtual conversations and manage to adopt the so-called President's Statement on the human rights implications of the pandemic by way of a silence procedure. This statement requests the High Commissioner to report on a regular basis about the human rights implications of the pandemic with a view to help building back better, as the Secretary General keeps saying. The Human Rights Council is a machinery which provides the world with reliable and up-to-date information. It is supposed to address both protracted and looming human rights issues. In the last two weeks, for example, we had an urgent debate on racism as a follow-up to the George Floyd tragedy and a discussion on the latest developments in Hong Kong. These two examples show that the Council's daily work is a rather good reflection of global developments. I am convinced that this webinar will help you see the added value which the Human Rights Council can have for your work and will also show you where parliaments could have some added value for the international human rights work being done. Thank you very much for your interest. I wish you a very interesting session.